I was born in Berlin, Germany in 1928, at which time Hitler had not come to power. It was under the Weimar Republic, which had troubles because of the uh, unemployment situation, the bleak economic situation, and turmoil on the streets of Berlin between communists and Nazis and other groups. But the majority of Jews in, the Weimar, in Weimar Germany in the 1920s were thoroughly assimilated and most were part of the broad middle class. Jews attended synagogues and of their choice and enjoyed all the cultural amenities for which the Germans were famous. The Jewish community felt secure during that time and their loyalty belonged to Germany. They considered themselves Germans of the Jewish faith, but due to the politics and the stark economy after Germany's loss in World War I, in, in 1933 the Weimar Republic failed and Adolf Hitler became chancellor and Germany became a totalitarian state. I cannot, be, cannot begin to tell you, uh, at that time I was five years old, how that affected me and my parents especially. I have no, I have no siblings and uh, we lived in a small house, no relatives, but uh, every edict by the Nazis, anti-Semitic laws, almost every week were uh, put forth. After, well, let me go back a little bit. Uh, after World War I, Germany suffered rampant inflation, massive unemployment, and severe economic dislocation. Religious anti-Semitism, which had existed since the early years of the Christian church, became more vo volatile. This became a useful tool for political anti-Semites from the very beginning. Hitler's racial ideology was included in the Nazi program that laid down the aggressive policy towards Jews. My father, Fritz Wildorf, served for three and a half years in the German army during World War I with distinction, and since worked in the textile business. He married my mother in 1922. She was the daughter of a prominent Berlin lawyer. But due to the massive inflation and investment losses, my family became seriously impoverished. My parents and I lived in a small apartment on the top floor of a house which had no elevators. I went to public school until my seventh birthday when additional racial policies between Jews and non-Jews, anyway, contact between Jews and non-Jews were, were restricted and I was expelled from grammar school. I then attended a Jewish school which soon thereafter was set ablaze. We know about Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when Nazi stormtroopers and their sympathizers rampaged in all German towns. Stores were broken into, setting houses of worship on fire. Thousands of Jews were rounded up and herded into concentration camp. It was nightmarish. My mother soon realized that we had no future in Germany and investigated our chances to leave and immigrate to another country. But with a family's limited resources, few relatives abroad, the few options open became Shanghai. We, have, we had no knowledge or language of, their, of customs or what it was like at all. We booked my mother, father, Booked, and myself, we booked passage on the German ship Gneisenau 
which routinely traveled from Bremen to Yokohama, Japan, with stops at Shanghai. World War II had not started, and we were still able to stop at British ports and use the Suez Canal. We, we left Ber um, Bremen on Christmas 38 and arrived in Shanghai January the 24th, 1939. The ship docked in the middle of the Wangpu River opposite the Bund. We were impressed, of course, by the large buildings, but we had no idea what to expect, none whatsoever. A tender took us to the dock where we were greeted by the Jewish Welcoming Committee. At the pier, we were not asked for papers or documentations, and soon we mounted an open truck and, driven, and were driven to our new quarters in the embankment building along the Suchow Creek. The building was owned by a prominent Jewish family. Men and women were divided and settled in separate dormitory rooms. Each of these large rooms were filled with bunk beds and cots. We were given towels and bed sheets. Uh, I must say that um, early on, when there was only a small stream of Jews European Jews arriving in Shanghai, the trickle was small, and there was no pressure on, on, on the Shanghai government to uh, restrict the Jews. But later on, when there were thousands came, restrictions were instituted and visas were required. So basically speaking, I did not have to have a visa. But because of overcrowding, we were soon encouraged to look for a place of our, uh, of our own. And my parents, not knowing their way around to speaking English or any other language except German, walked up the North Sichuan Road. There we found a rental room in, in the Japanese quarters. Uh, I need to explain what Shanghai was all about in those days. Shanghai in those days were divi was divided into the international settlement and the French settlement, and the American settlement as well. These were spoiled of the, what I would call rapacious advances of the Western nations. A uh, hundred years earlier, gunboats forced their way up, up river and threatened, <coughs> threatened the Chinese government, headed at that time by a queen, to give up the coastal ports for, for uh, trade. So, and the Chinese were forced to cede Hong Kong, Shanghai, Tinsin, Macau, uh, a few other ports to to uh, were were forced to cede cede that, and uh, Shanghai was divided into the French and the international settlement, which was divided by four, 14 nations, was un, administered by 14 nations. The Japanese in, invaded the, the cities, the area around Shanghai in January, in, in December of 1937, and put Shanghai under siege and shelled Hongqiu, the outlying area, for, um, for, for two months. Ultimately, they, they uh, succeeded and uh, had 
a uh, a they're out they had their gunboats parked right there on the Wangpu as well in in, si in view of uh, of the international settlement so the japanese were there with their ships and they occupied and lived in part of Honkyu. And that is where we had in Honkyu, in the Japanese part, we had found our first uh, rental room on, on top of a building right under the roof. My mother always went and in, insisted that um, I get good schooling, and she arranged for me to to uh, to go to a British school, even though I don't spoke no English at the time, which entailed crossing a bridge where the Japanese were sentries with Japanese sentries, then walk to Nanking Road, take a double-decker bus for about an hour to the. Uh, Western outlying district of Shanghai, and of course to come back to that, to Hongqiu later on, and that took another hour. I joined the Boy Scouts and became a member of the YMCA. My friends enjoyed the movies and swimming at the YMCA. In the summer of 1942, my father caught cholera and died, which left us destitute. We then had to move into a refugee camp, which had become overcrowded. My mother and I were obliged to live in a hospital room together with seriously ill persons. I think we had bunk beds, of course, and seriously ill people, terminal cases, cancer terminal cases, and all of that. There was no other room in the camp. They then, the committee then moved us to a house in, on Yuhang Road, an ordinary row house located in a lane. It had two rooms, about 10 by 10, connected by a narrow stairway. A concrete sink supplied a cold water faucet the only bathroom facility was on a roof, which was furnished with a wooden bucket under a roof structure. Each room held at least four families sleeping in bunk beds. Privacy was non-existent. This is the way we, li we lived until the end of the war. Cooking was done on individual charcoal stoves outside, often in the rain. These stoves were hard to light and uh, a very frustrating situation. A community kitchen in the area supplied one meal per day, perhaps made up of noodles or beans, no meat. And we were supplied by a scrap of bread a day. I quit school to help my mother and became apprenticed at a machine shop where I learned with fa fascination with things mechanical. Later, I attended art schools to learn other trades. Younger people needed entertainment and it was supplied by, our, by talented refugees who formed dance bands, performed opera, symphonies, and cabarets. Sports was an important part of youth activity, and soccer was taken very seriously. As the years rolled on, destitution, illness, and starvation affected everyone in the ghetto and took its toll. On July 17, 1945, an American plane mistakenly dropped bombs on our area, killing 17 of our people and many of our Chinese neighbors. Our house was damaged and we had to resettle to a room in a school. 
The war ended a month later, but a change in our living conditions did not arrive until December with the, with the arrival of the American Air Force and Chinese soldiers. I was hired by the U.S. Air Force then to provide assistance to their malaria control group and responsibility for drinking water distribution. This was good training and the salary was adequate. We left for the United States in March of 1948 and settled in San Francisco. The patience, resiliency, and generosity of the Chinese people, uncomplaining, often under worse conditions than ours, gave me strength and guidance for a successful life. And now to see China's amazing growth and progress in the last 70 years is my constant delight. I think back on my time in Shanghai as my period of growth and learning and how the world has changed in that time. Thank you.